Shalom, this is Reverend John Farad, and we are in Lesson 83 in the continuing series, The Gospel According to Moses, on the book of Genesis. And we've come to chapter 39, and we're beginning the story of Yosef ben Yaachov, Joseph, the son of Jacob, or as Joseph of the many colored coat. You guys, all I can say is we are about to enter a Bible study journey that is just, the word awesome is too mild to describe this Bible study. Once again, we're going to take the story of Joseph, we're going to put it to its historical context, try to figure out how the Hebrews coming out of Egypt understood this story. They're the first ones that heard it. And God wanted them to learn something out of this story. So what did they hear? What did they see? What did they understand? Perhaps one of the things that they learned is about their God, that no matter what circumstances they were in, no matter if it's life or death, good times or bad times, that they, just like Joseph, were in the hand of God. The Lord was with them, no matter what circumstances they're in. So God applies this to them then, and he applies it to us now. We learn about God. We learn about who he is. It enhances our faith. It enriches our understanding. It shows us that God is the same now and forever. If you just take a look at a few verses. Malachi 3, verse 6. You can look these up on your own. Psalm 90, verse 2. Or Hebrews 13, verse 8, where it says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. As God protected Joseph, as God had Joseph in his hand, no matter what circumstances, so the Hebrews were able to say, God has us in his hand, oh, the nation of Israel, and us too. So we begin to see the paradigms of Adonai. Paradigm basically means patterns. And God does this. He does these patterns, these paradigms, over and over and over again. The rabbis recognized it. Maimonides in the late 12th and early 13th century, he made a statement, and his statement was, Ma'ase avot, siman le banim. Ma'ase avot, siman le banim. The lives of the fathers are signs for the sons. Now, I'm not going to go into that. We've already done this earlier in this entire series on the book of Genesis. But, for instance, we know a paradigm that's so familiar with us, the paradigm of Passover, the pattern of Passover. In the first Passover, the dads of each household picked the lamb on the tent of Nisan. The, it was a male, an adult, and they're going to sacrifice him and they were going to put the blood on the wood, the blood on the doorposts, as a sign unto God, so that they would be saved from the wrath of God that will be poured upon Egypt. So that's the fathers, and that's what they experienced in the first Passover. However, 1,500 years later, God himself says, you remember the lives of the fathers? Well, this is a sign. It's a sign of the Passover of the Messiah. Because God, the Father, he picked his lamb, the Lamb of God, probably on what we call Palm Sunday. Yeshua, his son, the Lamb of God. And he'll be sacrificed. And his blood will be put on the wood just like the Passover lamb in the story of the Exodus. His blood was on the wood on the cross. And Paul says, like in Romans 5, 9, that that blood saves us from the wrath of God. 
I mean, this is this is such a clear connection. Lives of the fathers are signs for the sons. Maase avot siman le banim. The first Passover, the redemption of Israel out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt. And the Passover Messiah, or the Messiah's Passover, the redemption, the redemption of all people, Jew and Gentile alike, from the bondage of sin. Now these paradigms, God does this again and again and again. I mean, the typical example, just study the feasts. Now you can go to the website, www.lightofmenorah.org, and remember, menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H. And light of menorah, just treat it as one word with no spaces. www.lightofmenorah.org. Look at the top of the home page, and you will see the YouTube channel link. Click on that. Get to the YouTube channel link. You'll see the word playlists. Click on playlist, and you'll see the feast. They're all there. Passover, Yom Kippurim. Shavuot, Pentecost, pick one. Pick any feast. And you see that indeed God set up the feast that has a specific purpose for the Hebrews then. But then God uses it also as a sign. A sign for the sons. A sign, a sign for us. And both of them are valid. These are the paradigm and the the paradigms are the patterns of Yahweh, Adonai our Lord. Another is a 50 year paradigm. It's based upon the 50 year Jubilee. There's a paradigm here, there's a pattern here. For more of this, for an in depth study, I highly recommend accessing videos, books by Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, who's a Messianic Jewish rabbi. For many of you, you probably know him already. This guy is world-renowned, very famous. Check out his book, The Oracle, or check out his other book, the brand new one, The Josiah Manifesto. And you can easily do an internet search on Rabbi Jonathan Kahn and the 50-year jubilee. There's so many videos on that as well. And he has a number of examples with regards to this 50-year pattern. For instance, it so happens that in 1917, the British Empire issued the Balfour Declaration. It was the first document in over 2,000 years pledging the land of Israel to the Jewish people. 50 years, exactly 50 years, from 1917 is the Six-Day War, June 1967. But before the war is over, Israeli soldiers for the first time in 2,000 years entered the gates of Jerusalem. The last time they were there was when they fought against the Roman Empire. But in the year of Jubilee, everyone shall return to his own possession. And here Israel is returning to its own possession. A 50-year paradigm. A 50-year pattern. Here's another one. Counting the years from 1967 brings us to the year 2017. Now in 1967 was the Six-Day War, and Israel basically was really de- holding on to Jerusalem. But in 2017, 50 years after the Six-Day War, there was a legal restoration of Jerusalem. It was the year President Donald Trump issued the Jerusalem Declaration. It was the first time since ancient times that any world power had ever issued such a declaration and given recognition to Jerusalem. And even when you talk about the rebirth of Israel, followed the template of the Jubilee, followed the pattern, the paradigm. The movement of Zionism began in 1897 back in Europe. 
and 50 years later, Israel was voted back into existence at the United Nations 50 years later in 1947. Exactly 50 years. But then we come to the year 2023. October 2023. And we come to the first Sabbath of October in the year 2023, and Israel is attacked by Hamas. And over 1,400 Israelis, some American citizens, by the way, and some soldiers were massacred. We've read about it already. It was a total surprise. And people are questioning what happened to the intelligence. Wasn't there any warning? But 50 years to the same Sabbath, 50 years ago, 1973, on the first Sabbath of October, Israel was attacked and so began the Yom Kippur War. They were attacked on the same day 50 years prior to that. Total surprise. And again, another intelligence failure. So God has set up a pattern. But one thing that we see again is we go back to that statement again. The lives of the fathers are signs for the sons. And Joseph was in the hands of God. And we take a look at Joseph's story. And now jumping ahead, we'll come back to that, but it's important to take a look at this now. Joseph tells us that even in all these difficulties and this craziness of his life, God had a purpose. You go to Genesis 45, verses 7 through 8. And Joseph says, God sent me before you, he's talking to his brothers, to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He was in God's hand. Joseph was always in God's hand. David, he was chased by Saul for years. Saul tried to kill him. But David was always in the hands of God. And you can imagine Israel coming out of Egypt. They began to see the same thing, God's characteristic of that they were in the hands of God constantly. And so for us too, we can proclaim, Ma'ase avot sinam lebanim. The lives of the fathers are signs for the sons. So in Joseph's story, we're going to see God's paradigm. Joseph was in God's hands, and so too for us. No matter what we face, no matter if it's good or bad, no matter if it's difficult or easy, no matter what, life or death, we are in the hand of God. And it's just like what God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Again, the lives of the fathers, the lives of Jeremiah, is a sign for us as well. So let's begin this amazing, awesome Bible study journey. Now, we're dealing with 12 chapters about Joseph. We're going to go from 37 to 50. You say, well, that's 13 chapters. Yeah, because we got this chapter on Tamar and Judah. 
Okay, that's chapter 38. What's that doing there? Okay, so we have to handle that. I'm not ready to handle that yet. I got a lot of research to do that. That'll come up in May. 12 chapters on this guy. Abraham, 12 chapters. Starting chapter 12 of Genesis. And we all the way went through uh, 24 and a small part of 25. Jacob, 10 chapters. If you actually study the tabernacle, God comes to Moses. He's on Sinai. And he comes to Moses and said, okay, here it is. For seven chapters, God says, this is how you're going to build it. It's going to have these sockets. It's going to have these boards. This is what the Ark of the Covenant is going to look like. This is the uh, table of showbread, etc. By the way, the high priest is going to be dressed in such and such and so on. Seven chapters on the tabernacle. We're not there yet. Why seven chapters? Is it important? Yep. Okay. We're not in Exodus yet. We'll probably, that, let's see. That, probably a couple of years from now. Anyway. So his life must be a big deal. Twelve chapters? So preliminary thoughts. We have to do some preliminary thoughts on this. Uh, we can't just, can't just jump in. One, what's really interesting is, and this is from Nahum Sarma in the uh, JPS Torah commentary, God never speaks to Joseph. Never. Not like Abraham, not like Isaac, not like Jacob. So it's possible that Joseph is not considered a patriarch because God speaks to patriarchs. Since God never spoke to Joseph, he's not a patriarch. So is, is that possible? Possible. Now, I will do this, though. Joseph recognizes God. Time and time he is, this is God, this is God, this is God. And yet, with God not even speaking to Joseph directly in a dream or says, or we, we don't have that phrase, and God came to Joseph and said, that doesn't happen. But the rest of the Torah is devoted to Joseph's life. Second, uh, there's an amazing lesson for us today, and that is God's hand is controlling awful events. You take a look at the story of Joseph, all those awful events, all the different things that we're going to experience and bump into because of his, and God controls those events. Joseph says this. He says it again and again, but specifically, he says this in Genesis 45. So we're going to the end of the story just to show you, okay, that, God, that even Joseph recognizes that God is controlling all of this. So I'm in Genesis 45, verses 7 through 8. Now here... Um, if I recall, Jacob hasn't died yet, but uh, they're all in uh, Egypt. Uh, the, the family is saved, and Joseph is talking to his brothers, and he says, again, this is going to be in uh, 45, 7 through 8, and God sent me before you to preserve you, a, a, a remnant in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So it was not you that sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Mitzrayim, or Egypt. Amazing. So indeed, God is controlling these awful events. And it's true then, but it's also true today. This is good news. This is what you call the gospel. Think about what Jesus says about himself when he's in the Nazareth synagogue, when he said, those in jail are going to be freed and the blind are going to see. And this is good news. Awful things happen and the Lord is going to come in and bless us. This, this is part of the gospel. I'm going to go to Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 8. So here's the writer of Hebrews. Very fascinating way that the writer of Hebrews looks upon Jesus. Listen to this. okay? And I'm starting in verses 5 through 8. Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. Matter of fact, it's Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. I just like that, the writer, somewhere, okay, didn't have it memorized. Besides that, they didn't have a numbering system for Psalms in those days. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. 
putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, here's the statement. Let's listen to this. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, Jesus, he left nothing outside his control. Who's in control? That's the gospel. Where's the gospel? You're reading it. It's the Joseph story. This is God. Nothing changed. Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord and I do not change. Jesus is in control. I love that. Romans 8, 28, we all know this. God causes all things to work together for good. That's Torah-based. Love God, okay? You're called to obey to his purpose, and he is going to be with you. So when you read Romans 8, 28, that's Torah. That's not anything new. Comes out of the story of Joseph, everything. I, like, I just love that sometimes I bump into these statements for me all these years. Oh yeah, that's Christianese. No, it's not Christianese, it's Torah-based. Amazing. Third, and most important, this really got me excited. Matter of fact, as I told you, I was, I'm so excited about teaching uh, this and as I continued to do the research, especially in these last couple of months, I bumped into stuff that I just, oh, let me share it with you. So the third comment before we get into 37, Rambam, one of the great rabbis in Judaism, his name actually was Moshe ben Memon, and the short nickname for him is Maimonides. Okay, that's a Greek way of saying it. He's actually known by the acronym Rambam. Lived in 1135 to 1204 AD. And he is actually writing. You can actually read this in his Genesis commentary. He has a commentary. Okay, just like Nahum Sarnar, JPS, John Kareed. He had one. And you can actually pick it up. It still exists. And so he's got a complete commentary on the Torah. On the, on the Torah okay? So in Breshit, in his commentary, he said, our rabbis, in other words, the rabbis that came before him said this, listen to this, the lives of the fathers are signs for the sons. The lives, the lives of the fathers are signs for the sons. In other words, as you look at the lives of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Things that happen to them are predictions for the future. They saw something. Events in Genesis predict the future. Now the purpose of this class, one of the purposes of the gospel according to Moses is to see Jesus in Torah. John 5, 39. Jesus is in the temple talking to the scribes, probably some Pharisees and probably some priests, Levites. And he said, all Torah or oral scripture testifies of me. He says that probably 24 to 30 AD. And the only scripture that they had was the Old Testament. And the primary books that were really the important ones in those days is the Torah. Now, what, is, what are the rabbis telling us? That God seems to be setting up a paradigm again and again and again. Let me explain. You'll see this in just a second. A paradigm, if you look the definition up of a paradigm, it's a model. It's a pattern. It's an example. So for instance, God sets up, oh, here's, here's a paradigm. Um, many, 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 many decisions, philosophy, all sorts of stuff is based upon this paradigm. The paradigm is the earth is round. Based upon the fact that the earth is round, you can now make decisions. You can study science in a certain way. A whole bunch of stuff comes from that paradigm. But if the paradigm changes and all of a sudden you find out that the earth is a triangle, we have a problem, okay? That the earth isn't a triangle. I really believe the paradigm is true, okay? But that's what I mean by here's another paradigm, okay? There's a paradigm called evolution. And certain people accept that paradigm. And from that, they make decisions that philosophy, teaching, and so on, a whole worldview based upon a paradigm of evolution. Are you with me? Okay? We Christians say, no, paradigm is not. God created everything, okay? So... There is a paradigm of God's deliverance. He sets up a paradigm, models, patterns. Passover. Passover is used to show us God's deliverance. One, he delivered his people 
through the Redeemer Moses when he delivered them from the bondage of slavery of Egypt. Yes, that's a valid and clear use of Passover. Okay, it's a picture. It it's, it's follows the paradigm. God used it then and he used it again. It's almost like God is saying, guess what? That's the first deliverance. I'm going to come. I'm going to be a Jew. And the great deliverance through Messiah Jesus is going to happen. And guess what? I'm going to use the same picture, the same model, Passover. It's a paradigm. But both of those are valid. Are you with me? Some people will tell you that Passover, okay, was really done because it only relates to Jesus. No, it doesn't. This relates to God and his deliverance. It's a paradigm. And the rabbis see this. I think that's why some of us get really pumped in this class. I, I really, and it's not me. It's God. You know, I'm finding this stuff and I'm just giving, remember what I said, I'm a sheep, just like you. He feeds me. And either I stay home and I keep this to myself or I come to you and have to feed you. Okay? Which I'd rather do because it's a lot more fun. See Peggy's smile on her face and so on. So anyway, is it the possibility that you're in this class and you get pumped up when you see Jesus in the Torah? Remember Isaac? He's the beloved son of Abraham. Firstborn of Sarah. He wasn't the firstborn, but the firstborn of Sarah. He's the child of promise, the child of the covenant, and he's going to be sacrificed. And he's a young man. He's not a boy. We already did that. We actually went into the Hebrew. He's a young man. And Isaac carried up the wood, up the hill, that was going to be used to kill him. Whoa. We saw a prototype of the Messiah. It's like God is saying, you want to see my Messiah? You want to know what he's like? Remember the story of Isaac? Something similar is going to happen. He's not Isaac. That was a real event, okay? Has real meaning, real purpose. We can study it, and we can get a lot out of that because that's God's teaching. But God is saying it's part of a pattern. It's a prototype. It's, it's a paradigm. So think about this. I'm going to go into Luke 24 to 32. Yeah, here it is. Remember the two guys on the Emmaus Road? And it says that Jesus took them through the Torah and the prophets. And listen to their statement. 24 verse 32. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? That's us! The paradigms, the pictures! Could that be, my, why? Because they were seeing this? Is that what Jesus was doing? I wonder. He's opening up the Torah to them. Remember the Bereans? Paul comes to Berea. These are Orthodox Jews. They never heard of Jesus before. Paul teaches about Jesus, the Messiah, and the Gospel. What's the only Bible they had? The Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament. And they said, come back next week. We're going to check the Scripture. What Scripture? The Torah and the Prophets. And they come back and they, wow, many of them believed. It's what it says. They checked the Old Testament and they saw Jesus. They saw the gospel because they said, Paul, what you teach is true. And I just have a funny feeling it has something to do with this paradigm, these pictures, this pattern, these prototypes. Now, the ancient Jewish scholars, ancient Jewish scholars, they were looking at this, and along with all of these paradigms and pictures, one of the things is they were really troubled because as they were reading the scripture, they were saying, Messiah, is he coming once or twice? And in Jesus' day, they had a debate. Matter of fact, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it is possible that they thought Messiah was coming four times. Here are the four names of the four Messiahs in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Messiah of Moses, the Messiah of David, these are four separate Messiahs. The Messiah of Moses, the Messiah of David, the Messiah of Aaron, and the Messiah of Israel. They were debating in Jesus' day. 
He's coming four times. They didn't know. And this debate was in Jesus' day. Now this middle, this continues on into the Middle Ages. The rabbis are looking at the story of Joseph and they say, you know, Joseph, he's like a paradigm, a model, a prototype of the suffering Messiah. I have Raphael Pate's book here called The Messiah Test. Raphael Pate is a Jewish scholar and what he did is he gathered all of the texts together in Jewish literature, Bible, uh, the, Mish, uh, the Mishnayim, all of it, and this is all related to the Messiah. That's all it is. It's not a teaching about Messiah or anything, but this is everything related to the Messiah. So he says in here, during Talmudic times, so now you have to know this, the Talmud was completed roughly in 500 AD, the Babylonian Talmud. So this is probably 300, 400, 500 AD and then even into the Middle Ages. So in these days, they said, when the death of Messiah became an established belief, so, I mean, the rabbis were saying, Messiah's going to die, he's going to get killed, okay, based upon the scripture. This was felt to be uh, irreconcilable with the belief in the Messiah as the Redeemer, who would usher in a blissful millennium of the Messianic age. The dilemma was solved, because they split the Messiah into two people. So this is in Talmudic times, not in Jesus' day. They did not do this in Jesus' day. So they said, we're going to call one of them the Messiah, the son of Joseph, and the other one we're going to call him the Messiah, the son of David. No, they split the Messiah into two persons, and like I said, it took, in, took, uh, took place in the Talmudic times. Now the Messiah, now listen to this. This is Jewish, listen, this is so cool. The Messiah was perfectly prefigured in Moses. Did you hear that? The Messiah was perfectly prefigured in Moses. Stop. We haven't got the Exodus yet. I'm more excited about Exodus and teaching you about the connection between Moses and Jesus. This, my head spins, okay? I just love this stuff. But Moses, listen, but Moses died. No, he's a prototype. He's a paradigm, Okay? But Moses died before he could lead the children of Israel into the land of promise. Moses died before the restoration, okay? Consequently, the Messiah too has to die before accomplishing the great task of the ultimate redemption. The ultimate redemption that Israel would be in the land forever and they would inherit every square inch of what God promised them in the Torah. The Messiah has to die first. Since, however, the Messiah would not be the true redeemer of God if he did not fulfill the ultimate task, the only solution was to let one Messiah, like Moses, die and then assign the completion of the work of redemption to another Messiah. You begin to wonder why they missed the point? This is amazing. They said the suffering Messiah is like Joseph. He's going to save Israel, but... Before the complete restoration is going to happen, he's going to die. There is also going to be a conquering Messiah who's going to save Israel and establish the kingdom, like David. Now, isn't it interesting that Joseph dies and he never sees his people return to the promised land? Jesus died. He ascended to the Father. The final redemption hasn't taken place. Israel is not secure. They don't even own the West Bank, which is theirs, according to the Bible. You see what I'm saying? The final redemption hasn't happened. This fits. And the Jewish rabbis are teaching us Christianity. I just, I want to dance. The truth, God's truth. So Joseph is the savior of Israel and the savior of the world. The savior of the world. What was happening? They didn't have anything to eat. So... He stored up bread, the bread of life. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And he picks up the unleavened bread at his Passover meal. He said, this is my body. Take this and eat. The living bread, the living life. Same story. Bread, Joseph and Jesus. Whoo! You ready? Put your seatbelts on. So, 
Joseph, who's a real historical figure, and we're going to check more on this later, he's in the hand of God. His life is engineered through good times and bad times to save the known world at that time with wheat. And what does wheat give? The bread of life. I mean, that's the staple of life was bread in the ancient times. We could say, therefore, the bread of life. And Jesus, who's Lord, Savior, Messiah, he too is, who is God, he too is a real historical figure. And we take a look at his life clearly in the hand of God. His life is engineered and planned to the smallest detail. Why? To save the world with the bread of life himself. And again, the paradigm, the pattern that God sets up over and over and over again. In the introduction, we talked about that phrase, Ma ase avot sinam le banim. The lives of the fathers are signs for the son. Yahweh, the Lord, uses the story of Joseph as a sign for us and his what he was going to do in the future to save the world. I like to call it the paradigm of Yosef and Yeshua. It's very interesting because Yosef starts with the Hebrew letter Yod. Yeshua, his name, starts with the Hebrew letter Yod. Or there's the paradigm. We haven't got there yet. Between Moses and Messiah. Moses and Messiah. Moses' name begins with the Hebrew letter, Mem. And Messiah begins with the Hebrew letter, Mem. So it's fascinating to take a look these patterns and these paradigms that God has set up. So in Lesson 84, we're actually going to start reading Genesis 39 about the story of Joseph. We're going to see and meet him for the first time. We're going to read about his father Jacob, who looked upon his son Joseph in a very unique, special way. It probably has a lot to do with the fact that that Jacob's love of his life was his wife, Rachel. Now, he had his other wife, Leah, but we have shown earlier in this series that Leah wasn't hated. She was loved less. She was in a secondary position. So, when we look at this, Jacob's love for Joseph was quite amazing, and it, it separated Joseph from his brothers. They came to hate Joseph. And it's like Yeshua, it's like Jesus. He was the father's, he was the father's chosen one. His beloved, his firstborn. And Jesus' brothers hated him. They crucified him. So in Lesson 84, we're going to again see the paradigm. We're going to see again the patterns of Adonai. Ma'ase avot sinam le'banim. The lives of the fathers, the life of Joseph, is a sign for the sons. A signs for us now. The signs of seeing Jesus in a more clear and a more enhanced and a more awesome way. So I'll see you in Lesson 84. And we'll remember in Luke 24, 50 that Jesus lifted up his hands to bless his 120 disciples before he ascended the Father, just like the high priest daily lifts up his hands. It could very well be that Jesus blessed them with the ironic blessing. I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. I'd like to end our session 
with that blessing. That blessing that's based upon the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses to Aaron to bless the people. Yevarekeinu Adonai Vishmarkenu, Yair Adonai Panava Alenu, Vekunakinu, Isa Adonai Panava Lenu, Viasem Lanu Shalom, Vishem Yeshua Adonenu, Amen. So together, let's say this in English. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.